Okay, so the P ratio. Now, if you haven't heard of the P ratio, what it refers to is the amount of weight change that is accounted for by the body's protein reserves. So per unit of weight change, how much muscle are you gaining along the way? And that's what we're concerned about here. That's what the P ratio was referring to. So the thing is, gaining fat is actually easier than gaining muscle. And that's what research tends to show. So if your goal was to just gain weight and you weren't really training with weights and you just ate more food, on average, you'd gain 55 to 65% fat mass and the remaining 35 to 45% would be lean mass, would be muscle mass, okay? So that's what we need to know, okay? We need to also know that the more fat you gain, the less muscle you gain. So your P ratio is very much uh, determined by how much body fat you are starting off with. Okay, as body fat levels rise, there seems to be a decrease in the amount of lean body mass gained per unit of body weight change. Now, the physiological mechanisms as to why this may be the case are that fat cells are more sensitive to calories than muscle cells are. And as body fat rises, so does insulin resistance and systemic inflammation. Okay, both of those factors can compromise your ability to grow muscle. Now, we have some research which shows that as calories rise, okay, as individuals consume more calories, they do gain slightly more muscle, but they also gain a lot of fat mass. So here we have a study by Garth, which was conducted in 2013. It was conducted on elite athletes. Okay, so these guys had been training for quite some time. They were Olympic level athletes. Now, the intervention period was, was eight to 12 weeks. Okay, and the goal throughout that period was to gain weight and try to build some muscle. So there were two groups. One group was consuming a 500 calorie surplus, which was prescribed by a dietitian and they were getting nutritional counseling. The other group, which you can see on the graph there in red, was eating ad libitum. What that means is that they were eating based on their preferences. If you look at the results though, they were eating in a surplus because they did gain weight. That's important. So throughout this period, they were training four days a week and these are the results. Okay, so the 500 calorie surplus group gained over two and a half kilos throughout the intervention period the ad libitum group gained less weight. Now, when it comes to LBM, which refers to lean body mass, the 500 calorie surplus group gained slightly more lean body mass, as you can see there. Okay, so that half a kilo more. But if you look at the fat mass gains, the 500 calorie surplus group gained a lot more fat mass. Okay, so this goes to show that fat cells are more sensitive to calories than muscle cells are. If they weren't, then the group eating more food would gain a lot more muscle and wouldn't have gained as much fat. Now we have another study here, which was conducted in 2019 by Riberio on bodybuilders. So advanced bodybuilders who at, were at an IFBB level. Okay, so that's an advanced um, competitive federation. Now the bodybuilders here were assigned to two groups. One group consumed 67.5 calories per kilogram of body weight. Um, altogether on average, that was 6,000 calories. That's what they were consuming on a day-to-day -day basis for four weeks. That is a very large amount of calories, okay? The second group was still consuming a lot of food, uh, 4,500 calories on average, but a lot less than the opposing group. Now, these guys were training six days a week, so they had a push-pull uh, leg split. So they were training with really high volumes, four sets on every single exercise. And here are the results. So again, the group eating more food, in this case, gained a lot more body weight. So what you're looking at there is a percentage change. So not kilograms. So they didn't gain 10 kilograms. They gained 10% of their body weight there. When it comes to lean body mass, the group eating 6,000 calories, they gained slightly more lean body mass, but it wasn't a significant difference. As you can see there, it wasn't practically significant. And the group that it was eating more food gained heaps more fat mass. Okay, you can see that there on the graph. It is quite clear. Again, exemplifying the fact that fat cells are very sensitive, sensitive to calories. Okay, and if you're not careful with how you prescribe your dietary strategies, then fat mass can be acquired a lot faster than muscle mass can. Okay, so we just need to be smart about that. What I'm trying to um, suggest here is that the P ratio is really important, 
okay? And we need to try and maximize the P ratio when we are looking to build muscle. So remember the P ratio being the amount of muscle gained per unit of weight gain in this case. Now, the problems, like I've already mentioned, are that gaining fat is easier than gaining muscle. The more fat you gain, the less muscle you gain. Okay, so what is the solution then? What we need to do is we need to manipulate dietary intervention strategically. Okay, so it's not all about eating as much food as you can to ensure that the physiological object objective is attained and these problems aren't encountered. So what we're trying to do when we are building muscle okay, in a long-term gaining phase is we're trying to minimize the amount of fat mass gain because that will ensure that our P ratio is upheld and it's maximized throughout the length of the gaining phase. Okay, and as you can see there, that is one of my clients from last year. He competed in bodybuilding. On the left, obviously his before photo when he first started working with me and on the right after a very prolonged gaining phase. Okay, so the goal was to reduce the amount of fat mass that was acquired throughout that gaining phase and optimize rates of muscle growth. So what can we do from a calorie perspective to ensure that we are optimizing muscle growth? Well, we need to understand that the daily energy cost of protein turnover accounts for about 20% of resting energy needs. Okay, so what this means is that the process of muscle protein synthesis is energy expensive. It actually costs energy to build muscle and it costs energy to hold onto that muscle. Like I said, so skeletal muscle remodeling is energy expensive. And the thing is, if we are in an energy restricted state, even for a short period of time, rates of muscle protein synthesis will be compromised. Can we see that here? Five days in a moderate energy deficit leads to a 27% reduction in muscle protein synthesis. So this shows that under eating is not conducive to muscle growth. We can't be under eating if we want to build muscle. Okay, and you hear a lot of people who you know, try and build muscle, but they try and stay lean. So they train to build muscle and they eat to stay lean to lose fat. Those two strategies, they don't correspond well with each other. Okay, if you want to build muscle, you need to dedicate yourself to eating at energy balance or in a surplus. And the conclusion that we can come to here is that a calorie surplus is required to power the molecular machinery inside muscle cells and maximize muscle growth. So yes, you can build muscle in an energy deficit, but that's not gonna be maximal muscle growth. What we are concerned about in this lecture is optimizing muscle growth. So we're not gonna talk about body recomposition, we're talking about improving rates of muscle growth. So this is the way I like to think about it. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, um, trying to experience anabolism within our muscle cells. Okay, so we're trying to build this anabolic environment. Think about it like this. Within your muscle cells, you have all these workers running around. They're trying to build a brick wall. Okay, the brick wall itself is the muscle fiber. So as you can see there, there's various brick walls because there's heaps of muscle fibers in a whole muscle. Now, for, for a muscle to grow, those brick walls need to obviously get larger and larger. They are made out of amino acids. Okay, so we obviously need to be consuming an adequate amount of amino acids or else we won't have any bricks lying around to put to use. Now, there's a bunch of workers trying to build this wall up, but there's also another opposing team of workers which are simultaneously pulling bricks off the wall. Now, if you have amino acids lying around, if you have bricks lying around, the workers are gonna obviously try their best to, to build up the wall. But without calories, without incoming energy, they're not gonna have as much energy to, to, to actually push them to build the wall as high as possible. So to create an anabolic environment within our muscle cells, what we are after is obviously an adequate amount of amino acids, which we'll talk about soon, but we need calories to ensure the workers in the muscles are working at full tilt all the time. That's pretty much our goal. So when you hear people throw around the term anabolic environment, that's what you wanna be thinking about. Now, when it comes to the size of the surplus, so we've established a calorie surplus is important. How do we establish the size of the surplus? Well, calorie intake must abide by a few, a few rules. Okay? And these, these are rules. So at minimum, it must equal the sum of the tissue's parts. So think about it this way. If you wanted 
to finish a puzzle, you'd need every single piece of that puzzle, right? So the same thing here, you need enough calories to equal the amount of energy required to build a certain amount of muscle. The calories that you're consuming also need to be sufficient enough to supply substrate to fuel MPS. Remember I said MPS is an energy, energy expensive process. So you need to have enough energy to supply enough fuel for that process. It needs to account for the increased metabolic cost of accumulated muscle and diet induced thermogenesis. So what this means is that when you build muscle, like I said, that muscle is gonna then cost energy to hold on to. So the amount of calories you're consuming needs to account for that. It also needs to account for the fact that eating more protein and eating more calories actually burns energy throughout the digestive process. Okay, so that needs to be accounted for too. The calorie surplus must also overcome the compensatory elevation in total daily energy expenditure. Okay, so generally when individuals overfeed, their total daily energy expenditure may rise slightly. And we're going to talk about that later. There is definitely inter-individual variability when it comes to the amount or the degree of rise in total daily energy expenditure. And we need to take that into account with our calorie surplus. The calorie surplus must also cover the energy cost of resistance training plus the post resistance training elevation in metabolism. So remember, resistance training requires energy and afterwards we elevate the amount of the elevate muscle protein synthesis, which means our metabolism is working in overdrive. We need to account for the energy that is required in that process as well. And we obviously need to cover the cost of extracurricular activity. So if your clients or yourselves um, are also performing endurance training and aerobic training and you know, you're running, you're swimming, you're doing whatever, um, whatever activities outside of resistance training, they need to be covered as well in your calorie surplus. Okay, so we need to be ticking all those boxes with the surplus size. And this is a bit of a graph which, will, which indicates that as the surplus size increases, muscle gains tend to taper off slightly. So there seems to be this sweet spot. Okay, so once we tick all the boxes in the previous um, slide, extra calories don't seem to induce further muscle growth. And we see that here, we see mass gain increasing. Okay, the blue line is muscle mass, so muscle mass increasing, but then tapering off. Now the thing with fat mass is, and I've mentioned this you know, already today, and you've probably you know, built up an idea, um, about how calories will lead to increased fat mass. Fat mass gains are actually exponential. You can see them continue to increase. Okay, based on what I've said, you should have already started to establish that in your mind, right? So the more calories you consume, the more fat you're prone to gaining, and you can see that there. So with a lack of direct scientific evidence, what I can recommend is a calorie surplus of 350 to 500 calories per day, okay? That surplus will ensure that MPS is augmented and fat mass gains will be minimized, okay? That's what we're looking for there at the moment. That's what um, the scientific um, literature tends to suggest, 350 to 500 calories.